times possible. Here with us today is Leakey Foundation grant recipient and 2019 MacArthur Genius, Dr. Jenny Tung. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Ariel, for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. So Jenny is joining us from North Carolina, where she is Associate Professor of Evolutionary Anthropology and Biology at Duke University. Um, she is also um, Associate Director of the Amboseli Baboon Research Project in Kenya. We'll be discussing her work, looking at the interplay between social experience, genes, and health. Um, but before we start, for those of you watching us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, please be sure to ask questions to Jenny anytime in the comments. Um, the sooner you ask the questions, the more likely they will be asked at the end of the episode. So get those questions in. Um, so Jenny, um, it seems kind of like common sense that our health would be impacted by social experiences like stress and isolation. Um, I feel like, you know, personally, my in my own experiences, I'm more likely to get a cold if I'm under a lot of stress. But from a scientific perspective, how do you connect, make that connection between, you know, health and social experience? Yeah, this kind of work is in such a funny space because I think as you've articulated, lots of people have personal experience, anecdotes, um, intuition that uh, chronic social stress can influence their health. And there's plenty of data that suggests that um, social adversity predicts bad health outcomes, but it's actually been an incredibly difficult thing to pin down because it's also possible that when you're feeling stressed yeah. out, you're not eating a healthy diet or you're not yeah. going to the doctor like you're, you're supposed to do, or um, maybe even that you haven't been feeling that well to begin with. And that's actually feeding back to cause that stress. Yeah. So actually understanding how these things work is, has been a, a pretty thorny problem for some time. And so even though, um, not only could you, you know, ask most people on the street, you know, about how they feel when they're stressed, there's been tons and tons of evidence showing that there's a correlative link between the two things. Understanding whether there's actually a causal relationship has been the real difficult problem. And, and one of the places where I think that um, non-human primate research and animal research in general can, can really help us understand something about ourselves. Yeah, it's, um, and it's, it's so interesting too, because um, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you know, do all your research from an evolutionary perspective. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I'd love to know, you know, more about uh, how you became interested in evolutionary anthropology, kind of what a part in your career. And, and also to kind of build on that question, you know, how is it that um, looking at these questions, you know, from an evolutionary perspective is unique? Right. So um, my particular interest um, started at, at university. So I actually went and did my undergrad, uh, my undergrad research, my undergrad degree at Duke too, where I teach now. And so um, I think like many people coming into college for the first yeah. time, you know, in, in, in high school and you take math, you take, you know, you take biology, you take, uh, you know, writing, um, you take social studies, you don't take evolutionary anthropology. So it wasn't a field that I had actually heard of or really understood anything about before um, I came to college. But I was lucky enough to have some really fantastic professors, um, some of whom have become my colleagues now, um, uh, including in my first, first year of undergrad. I took a, a class in um, forging social ideals in an evolutionary mm -hmm. framework and, uh, with um, a woman named Julie Johnson, who had actually done her PhD research on baboons. Um, uh, as well. And I got hooked because all of a sudden there was this, this framework to understand um, why we behave the way we do and particularly behave the way we do in relationship to others, which I think is one of the most important things that determines um, how well we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's how I got interested. Um, I started doing uh, field work on a field studies program in Costa Rica. And then this is a picture from after I graduated college. Um, I spent a year in Suriname uh, watching brown capuchin monkeys. Um, so that's from back in about 2003 or so. Um, I, I started uh, doing research on baboons as um, actually as an undergrad, but I went out to, to study them in the field for the first time 
um, a little bit later in graduate school and um, really got hooked uh, on thinking about um, these amazing animals as a model for understanding our evolutionary history and also, you know, uh, the way our social behaviors influence um, our health and survival today. That's so neat. Um, you know, in our first episode of Lunch Break Science, uh, we spoke to primatologist Zareen Machanda, and she discussed about how chimpanzees and bonobos were such an excellent model for human behavior because they're our closest living relative, but with baboons, they're not quite as close. So why, why do you and other researchers look at baboons and other animals to learn about human behavior? Right, so um, I think there are both kind of intellectual reasons to do that, and then there are also some very practical reasons to do it. Um, from an intellectual standpoint, uh, when, when we think about placing humans in an evolutionary context, one of the questions that constantly comes up can basically be framed as like, how, how old is this? How deep does this, does this go? Yeah. You know, the, the things that are important in our lives, do we share them um, only with other humans? Do we share them with our closest relatives, the great apes, like Zareen studies? Or do they go much um, deeper in time? For example, does the evolution of complex sociality, um, of living in groups with the same individuals day to day, by itself trigger dependencies on social status or social integration in a way that really isn't um, about our species in isolation. And then from a practical perspective, um, I mean, there's a, there's a really good reason why baboons are among the, the best studied um, primates in nature. Here you have this large bodied, highly social terrestrial primate that radiated in sub-Saharan Africa. And that starts to sound pretty familiar um, because I could also be talking about the history of our own species. Um, they also happen to do this wonderful thing, which is often live in fairly open environments in which we can collect um, really detailed data about their behavior and about their life history. So um, I've been fortunate enough to work on them um, in conjunction with the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, um, which um, is particularly uh, special to me and I was drawn to work on because, well, one, my collaborators on the project, Susan Alberts, Beth Archie, Jean Altman are amazing, amazing scientists to work with in general. Yeah, I bet. But, um, through their foresight, um, particularly genes and Susans, this is a population that's been studied continuously um, since 1971. So we're gonna celebrate our 50th anniversary uh, next year. Wonderful. And that means that, yeah, we're starting to put together, we're hitting our ninth generation of baboons in this population, which opens the door to lots of questions one can answer about health and survival, including in an intergenerational context. I, that's, that's really fascinating. We'll have to have, um... We'll have to have a, another event about about that, but uh, that would be anyway. great. Yeah, <laughs> but back to your research. Um, so, how much of it is done in the field versus the lab, and and kind of what is the process like? So, um, we split our time a lot. Um, if you ever see me give like a, a full lecture with slides and everything, there'll be lots of pictures from the field because yeah. those are the prettiest pictures. But oh, yeah. um, we also do spend a lot of time in the wet lab and we actually spend quite a bit of time in computational work too. Um, and what that means is that depending on the interests of my students, um, they may spend more or less time um, in the field. Um, in most cases, we, we hope that even if people are doing um, work that is almost completely lab or computational based, they'll be able to go out there and see the baboons because that obviously inspires how we think about um, the data that we generate and also new questions that we can ask. Um, you know, increasingly, you showed a picture of me, that was from grad school working in our field lab. Um, with, <laughs> increasingly, we also try to blur the boundaries between field work and lab work. You know, um, with new technological developments, there's more and more stuff that we think that we're actually going to be able to do um, in the field itself. We already run, you know, minus 20s off off solar power yeah. and, um, you know, are doing more and more genetic data generation. Um, either in the field or in Nairobi with our collaborators um, there too, so. Awesome. Yeah, it, um, it's really interesting to, you know, kind of hear that, uh, that there's more of a kind of combination of them happening with the more resources you can have out in the field, mm -hmm. so. 
shifting kind of from your observation and collection of data, what are some of the correlations you found between social um, experience, genes, and health? Right. So, um, so some of the observations from Ambicelli in general, a lot of which has been led by um, by my collaborators, have have first demonstrated that if you measure aspects of the social environment, especially things like um, social bonds and social integration, that those have really powerful predictive effects on on animal lifespan. So in other words, how long you live is shaped, we think, or at least predicted, by how well you're integrated into your group and very strongly predicted by aspects of the social environment and mother offspring interactions early in life. Um, you know, that raises the natural question of, well, like, why? Why, why is it happening? Why? And I think this is one of the reasons why this overall topic has been so difficult to nail down from a, mm -hmm. from a scientifically well, mechanistic perspective to begin with, right? Like if you all of a sudden became really nasty to me, right? I might have my feelings hurt, but it's not obvious why that might um, influence my long-term health or if, you know, that happened on a repeated yeah. basis, right? And that's, that's a question that's really occupying a lot of our, our mental and scientific um, space right now in, in the Baboon Project. One of the things that we've been able to do is start um, asking how cells that are circulating in the blood that, you know, their major task tends to be an immune defense, actually change the um, genes that are turned on and off or turned up and down as a consequence of um, the experiences the animals are having. So for instance, if we draw blood from our animals, we can expose, um, you know, uh, parts of that blood, some of those cells, to things that look like a bacterial infection. And then we can ask, well, you know, who has a larger response to that simulated infection, you know, outside of the baboon's body, and who doesn't? And one of the things that's been um, pretty remarkable to see is that the, the best predictor that we've been able to find so far um, is actually male dominance rank, mm -hmm. where you know, these guys, they are, you know, um, they're, they're challenging each other for high status, where high status brings a lot of rewards in terms of resource and especially mate access. And, um, but also is probably pretty energetically uh, intensive. You know, they have to be on their toes. They're negotiating these, you know, potentially dangerous um, encounters with other males all the time. And what we've been able to observe is that males who actually make it to um, a high status position um, tend to turn up uh, pro-inflammatory pathways in these immune cells uh, quite a bit, um, which, you know, this is speculation at this point, which maybe makes sense if you're potentially getting in fights with other ind individuals or the risk is high. Um, but for females who also have hierarchies and rank, um, we see the opposite effect. So in females where they don't actually fight each other to maintain status, they just kind of inherit it from their moms, we see a pattern where being low ranking actually is most predictive of um, you know, inflammatory uh, gene expression, inflammatory gene regulation, which is actually closer okay. to the pattern that's more typically reported in humans. Really fascinating. Um, now, survival is a thread that's kind of woven through your research, and it really resonates with our mission at the Leakey Foundation. You know, we're not just focused on learning about the past, but we're, you know, really interested in learning how evolutionary research can help humans survive. Um, yeah. What is the role of survival in your research? Well, um, survival, lifespan, mortality risk, I... Uh, find myself really attracted to those kinds of measures as outcomes because it is really hard to see how those are uh, not, well, I should say it the other way. It's it's almost um, obvious how important those are to these yeah. animals. And it's also very impor important, you know, to, to ourselves, right? So we care about um, health and longevity and survival um, for, for many reasons, including, you know, that's what motivates much of our biomedical enterprise. But how long you live, um, for example, in species like baboons, is in fact the biggest predictor of lifetime reproductive success. This is the right. thing that if you needed, if you wanted to know one thing, would predict Darwinian fitness the best. So there's this really strong intersection between it being something that we care about 
from the perspective of human health and well-being and something that evolution has cared about for millions and millions of years, right? Yeah. Things that affect how long a baboon lives and how long a human lives matters um, in this sort of deep evolutionary time context in, in a really a really serious way. So it's like a very attractive, um, you know, variable to study because you have that that dual significance and it's it's really clear. Yeah, it's it's really really fascinating. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think you know within um, within just the the life of an individual versus kind of multiple generations. You know, what what do you see in the, as far as an impact it has? you know, stress and, and social experience on future generations? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're just starting to ask questions like that now, now that we have enough intergenerational um, data to, to get at it. And I think um, some of the most intriguing early findings uh, come from work that the Baboon Project has done on early life adversity. So what we know is that, um, baby baboons, juvenile baboons that have a lot of bad things happen to them, which for baboons, not dissimilar to humans, include things like low social status, social isolation, maternal loss, and, and so on. You know, those animals grow up to have much shorter lifespans. So we, we, we know that from um, some work a few years ago, and it's actually a remarkably large effect. Um, one of my colleagues, Susan Alberts' students, Matthew Zippel, recently did this analysis, um, and I think he is a Leakey Foundation grantee as well, um, uh, did this analysis to ask about whether when those kids grow up, right, and they have their own kids, whether this second generation of offspring is also influenced by, by basically environments that never happened to them, that environments that might have been 10 or 15 years in the past. And I think what that research showed quite convincingly is that early life adversity in one generation can influence the survival probability of the next generation, again, in, in kind of um, a substantial way. And that's controlling for anything that happened to that kid itself, so. That is so, that's really, really fascinating. Do you think, I mean, because you, you're a mother, uh, do mm -hmm. you think about, do you think about kind of of your life experiences and, and, and your your son's life experiences. I'm just, I, I have to put this picture up because it's just so cute. Yeah, that's that was my son Kieran's um, trip to Kenya last, last, last year. That's actually us in Ampicelli. Um, uh, I think about this stuff a lot more with respect to my personal life. You know, I, I think about the importance of early life experience and early life exposures. Um, and I think about the importance of social relationships and social connectedness in a way that is much more present um, in my mind than I think uh, it would have been had I gone down a very different research path. Sure, yeah. There is so much going on in the world right now. Uh, I mean, global plan, pandemic, you know, inequality, social isolation. What can we learn from your research about the conditions that are, you know, you know facing us all right now? Well, um, certainly our work is, you know, it provides a few data points and a sea of data points to um, to argue that social inequalities are are seriously consequential for health outcomes. Oh, yeah. That that's a large body of work and. Um, and I think it's pretty clear already that the pandemic is exacerbating existing social inequalities and probably amplifying um, um, health, uh, health outcomes that were already tied to existing inequalities. So that's certainly um, an outgrowth of the pandemic that um, I think we will need to pay a lot of attention to, not only because of the immediate moral and ethical dimensions, but because this is going to have ramifications for um, public health in our society, yeah. probably for many years to come. Um, and I think the other thing that it's told me is, you know, it just gives me a reason to understand why social distancing is so hard for us. You know, we find it really hard and really stressful. And we obviously break those rules, you know, often, right? Yeah. Humans break those rules often without strong, um, 
strictures against them. Yeah. And I think that's in part because we have spent tens of millions of years evolving in groups where social connectedness is important, right? So we have a response because of that evolutionary history to being apart from one another. And I think that's playing a big role right now in terms of, again, how just, just how challenging we're all finding this. Is, you know, is everything kind of going on now changing some of the framework of your research questions? Um, yeah, so I have spent my whole career studying um, non-human primates and expanding a little. We do some research now also on other social mammals, again, because I think there's always this question about how deep this, does this go? How fundamental mm -hmm. is this to social evolution? Um, I have... Uh, I have never uh, worked on human populations, but you know that's starting to to be a real pull. And yeah. so we are starting some collaborations with uh, colleagues who work in um, human immunogenomics or social epidemiology to think about how the sort of social environments of people who are living right now, including living through this period, might influence how their immune system functions in ways that might parallel some of the things we've done in other species. I mean, and, and I'm assuming your field work has got to be majorly impacted by, by COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> um, all our field work happens um, outside of the country and uh, the travel restrictions have made that much harder. So, um, uh, I have been uh, going to Amboseli every year, at least once a year since 2006, and that's just not gonna happen this year. Um, and it's not gonna happen for um, many of my close collaborators and our students either. Uh, and and that's, that's tough, that's requiring adjustment. I mean, yeah. I think we are fortunate um, as a field site uh, relative to, to some other possible um, outcomes uh, during the pandemic, but certainly it's it's a big difference from from what we're used to. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just it's 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 really interesting just hearing uh, the the different ways the different field sites and 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 labs are affected by it. But um, it is it's just um, it's 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 just shifting so many things. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So you're a MacArthur genius. What does that mean? And what was it like to find out about, about getting that award? Um, it was a very big surprise. Um, it was completely unexpected. It was um, uh, in, incredibly, um, oh, I don't know, incredibly uh, meaningful to have that kind of recognition of um, the type of work we do. Uh, and I suppose that um, mostly now I just feel some level of obligation to try yeah. and figure out how to, to, to live up to that, that investment. Yeah. Well, and I know you, you spend, you know, a lot of time, you know, kind of cultivating your students and, and making sure I, I, at least from what I've kind of read and, and heard from you is is that um, you know that that creativity that you bring to your research, you know, you really help your students bring to theirs as well. Um, um, I hope that's true. I would say that th that's a very two way street, and a lot of the things that that now I now think about are because my students, you know, pushed our work in that direction. So, um, yeah, it's 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 this is this is very much a collaborative effort, and we seek inspiration wherever we can. Well, that is so wonderful. And um, we're going to take some questions now from the audience. Um, so, oh, oh, here we go. Do pro-inflammatory tendencies differ from pair bonded species to non-pair bonded? I don't know the answer to that question explicitly. Um, I think there's actually a ton of, of, of space. Um, I don't I don't know the person who's asking the question, but maybe you could go there um, to do more comparative work, right? Because the type of stuff that we're doing involves a lot of granular individual centered data within a population, within a species. 
but obviously the ways that um, the social, the, the salient aspects of the social environment and the ways that social hierarchies or social bonding patterns work differ a lot, even, you know, across primates. And so I would love to see more, more um, targeted work that asks, well, you know, when is this important and when is it not? And what is it about the social environment that's important in these different kinds of structures? That's fascinating. Um, oh, oh, here we go. Are humans the most social primate? Um, I think that probably depends on how you define um, what being social is we certainly are very complicated social primates. I mean, one of the reasons that we study, I guess I probably didn't mention this, that we study other other primates is because um, by and large, I mean, they're complicated, but we can summarize their um, social hierarchies in kind of like a single dimensional measure. Whereas humans, we do these amazing things where we interact with multiple layers of society simultaneously. So, yeah. you know, you could be um, highly integrated in your uh, your church, but relatively isolated at work. You could be high status on your baseball team, but you know, low status in another sort of circumstance. So, um, I don't know that we depend more on 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 positive social interactions than other primates do. Um, the, the effect sizes in other primates are actually, like where they've been estimated are very similar to, to humans, but we certainly complicate it the most. So maybe I'll answer it that We way. sure do. <laughs> what, do we have another question? And please everybody, um, if you're watching live, ask questions, comments. Oh, ah, Haile Retta who will be a, a upcoming speaker and guest at for Lunch Break Science asks, do you rule out the impact of other factors like stress due to predators or human intervention into their habitat? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the wild baboons that we study, um, I mean, so the benefit of studying natural populations is that when you see a convincing, robust effect, you go, okay, this is really relevant to animals in their natural environment. But the question um, definitely touches on one of the things that is a limitation of natural populations like, like the baboons, which is that you can try and statistically control for these sorts of things, but you can never do um, you know, sort of a gold standard experiment that rules out the possibility of contributions by these other kinds of factors. Um, we do think that when we're looking at social interactions between different individuals, that at least in the baboons, um, it's not obvious that individuals who have lots of um, reciprocal, long-term, stable relationships are the ones that would be most likely to be targeted by a predator yeah. um, or be affected by uh, human wildlife conflict, but we can't rule it out. So one of the things that we try to do in my lab is complement the work we do in the wild with some work that we do on captive rhesus macaques, different species, but also highly social, highly hierarchical, really dependent on their social environment. And there we can, we can actually take out a lot of those variables. And remarkably, we still see very strong effects on you know, things like how immune genes are activated or regulated, um, which provides some complementary evidence to suggest that what we're seeing is really about, or at least partly about um, the, the social experiences of the animals. Oh, ah, uh, we have our next one is, I believe baboon infants occasionally are stolen from lower, class, lower status females. Does this change their status in the troop and does it affect their health and other factors? Yeah, so um, baboons uh, remind me a lot of our own species in the sense that when there's new babies, uh, there's a lot of interest in the new babies. And sometimes that can result in infant uh, abductions. Um, the outcome of those abductions varies a lot. So if it's a, a higher ranking female stealing a baby from a lower ranking female, then there's this whole um, power hierarchy interplay just to, to get the baby back. Um, and, and sometimes that can have pretty negative outcomes for, for the kid. But in that direction, right, that's actually a reinforcement of the existing hierarchy rather than a reversal. Um, 
so the 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 biggest thing that um, there was some work by uh, by my colleague Susan and um, one of our former PhD students Amanda Lea that looked at when uh, females didn't end up in the hierarchy where they were supposed to be, you know, based on the families they were born in. And so it's not so much um, abductions that matter, but but something that is probably a longer term, bigger effect, which is, um, you know, did your mom die? You know, getting to the place in 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 the rank hierarchy that you're supposed to be is, is heavily mediated for baboon females by their relatives, by their female relatives, and especially by their moms. So if they don't have that kind of support, that's where you see violations of the expected hierarchy most often. Really fascinating. We have quite a few questions, so we're, oh, ah, okay. Um, how do you collect health data from baboons in the field? Um, well, so we are more limited than um, collecting health data from uh, animals in captivity or from humans. We can't get them to go see the doctor. We can't ask them about self-perceived um, health. Um, so we do what we can uh, based on the types of data we can collect. Some of it's observational. So for instance, um, the project can, collects long-term data on um, wounds and other injuries. So if there's a broken bone or an open wound, we track it and we also track progress until healing. Um, we do some uh, assessments from um, when we do periodic um, blood sample collections. And in that, that case, we can collect blood and take biomarkers from the blood samples. We also you know, measure um, the, the, the parallel of height and, and weight and um, check them for parasites and, and things like that. And then um, we have heavily relied for many, many years on whatever non-invasive measures we can use. So um, I had a former postdoc who used to um, talk about uh, turning poop into gold because we collect a lot of poop. And it turns out that can be really informative about a variety of things. Um, hormone levels certainly, um, um, uh, both sex steroid hormones and thyroid hormone levels are things that are measured um, in the population. Parasite loads are measured in the population from fecal samples. Um, there's some efforts to do more um, assessment of the immune system through uh, fecal samples. And we literally collect um, thousands of fecal samples every year. So the more we can do non-invasively, the better of a, of a, a look we have. For sure. I think we have time for one last question. What are other impacts of stress on fertility other than lifespan? Can stress mm -hmm. be that destructive in terms of fertility or is that too soon to ask? Um, well, we have some, some preliminary um, findings that I can share with you. Um, I think the answer probably depends on the nature of the stressful experience. Yeah. Um, our viewpoint in Ambicelli, oops, can you still hear me? I think the video, oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, our viewpoint in Ambicelli is really shaped a lot by work that people like um, um, Peter Ellison have done that you know, argues that, that current energetic balance, right? Are you, are you taking in more energy than you're expending is, is probably the best predictor of fertility measures like right now. Um, but we do have some intriguing evidence, for example, that female baboons that were born during really bad drought years um, have more compromised fertility when they're mm -hmm. adults later in life too. Um, so that's a fertility related outcome linked to, um, to a source of stress, in that case, an abiotic stress, not a social stress. And um, we also know again from some of uh, Susan's work with um, a research scientist uh, working on the project, Laurence uh, Jasquier, that um, the inner birth intervals in, in female baboons are predicted by things like like dominance rank. So um, I don't know if that's a that's a pathway through stress precisely, but it is a connection with some of the social factors that we think are also um, important in other kinds of outcomes. Well. Thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. And um, But again, just thank you, Jenny. Um, it was really great having you on Lunch Break Science. And um, and uh, yeah, it just was, was a really, really great episode. Thank you so much for, for letting me do this. This is a, a fun break in my pandemic housebound day. So. Yeah, and, and, and luckily, <laughs> 
Luckily, your dog stayed quiet the whole time. Amazingly, <laughs> yes. <I know. laughs> well, thank you out there, everybody, for joining us. Um, if you would like to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, Jenny Tung, and how you can help support research like Jenny's and educational programs like Lunch Break Science, visit us at leakyfoundation.org. Uh, right now, all donations will be doubled by two generous donors, meaning your impact will be doubled. Next Thursday, we meet Leaky Foundation scientist Rachna Reddy and explore the social lives of chimpanzees. Be sure to subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about upcoming episodes and groundbreaking discoveries in human evolution. Still hungry for science and can't wait till next week? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Leaky uh, Lunch Break Science is made possible by the generous support of Anna Gordon Getty and Camille and George Smith. Thank you all for taking time from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Uh, until next week, stay hungry for knowledge. Bye, everyone. <laughs>